celebration, the role of faith and spirituality in HIV prevention, research, and treatment. In the honor of World's AIDS Day, this lively session will provide an opportunity to reflect on the valuable contributions that HIV leaders have made since early in the epidemic. Open remarks will be provided by Dr. Michael Sag, but at this time, let's have a moment in silence to honor those that we have lost with HIV and those that are living with HIV. Thank you. Now we will open with an opening prayer by Khadidra Abdullah. Khadidra. Thank you. Oh God, please put Rahma, our mercy, in our hearts. Please remove the stigma surrounding HIV and let those living with HIV feel safe and welcome in their own community. O Lord of mankind, please protect and heal our hearts from discrimination, for you are the healer and there is no healing except yours. I mean, dear God, please empower us to educate ourselves and understand how far treatment has come, how those living with HIV can live long, healthy lives and bear children of their own who are not born with the virus. Please inform the people about you equals you and how you cannot treatment the virus to anyone else. O Lord of the world, please push our faith leaders to step out and step up by spreading the message of compassion in their kutbahs, in their sermons, in their lectures. Enable them to teach HIV in their programming and create a safe space for all who are affected. O God, please bring families closer who have fallen apart. Let them love their kin who are positive. Dear Lord, please help those in isolation who have no one to talk to, especially during the time of COVID. Those who are alone and cry out at night in despair. Oh Lord, please shower us with your mercy, your rahma. I mean, oh God, please protect those of us who are fighting or protesting in these streets, fighting for black lives, screaming protect black lives. Oh Lord, please let justice be served, even in the time of COVID. Please save black lives and with the world of racism. I mean, dear God, thank you, thank you for showing us the way. I mean. In honor of World's AIDS Day, this lively session will provide an opportunity to reflect on the valuable contributions HIV leaders have made since early in the epidemic. Opening remarks will be provided by Dr. Michael Sag. The panel will share reflections and perspectives on how faith and spirituality have impact HIV pre prevention, research, and treatment efforts. We will follow up with overarching questions on how medical providers, caregivers, faith-based organizations, and HIV community can continue to impact HIV prevention, research, and treatment through faith and spirituality. And finally, the panelists will share the call to action on ending the HIV epidemic through new and ongoing interventions and, in, and initiatives. At this time, I would like to introduce the moderator. I'm Edward Jackson, which is a Community Engagement Programs Manager, Behavior Community Science Corps at UAB. I'm also part of the InterC for Faith and Spirituality Research Collaborative and on the Mayor's LGBT Positive Advisory Board here in Birmingham, Alabama. The co-moderator this afternoon would be Elder George Kerr III. Elder Kerr is the founder CEO of G3 Associates, the co-moderator of the President's Criterion HIV Network, PHIVN, PHEWA, the Presbyterian Church, USA. Community Partnership Council and the Co-Community Lead for Drug Users Health, SIG, in Washington, D.C. Center for AIDS Research. In the panelists, uh, the esteemed panelists that we have joining us, 
uh, this afternoon, we will start with Dr. Michael Sag. Dr. Sag is the Associate Dean for Global Health, Jim Straight Lead Chair in AIDS Research. He's the Director of UAB Center for AIDS Research, Professor of Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Welcome, Dr. Sag. Thank you, Eddie. It's great to be with all of you today and to uh, kick off this really fantastic faith and spirituality program. I think what I'll do is kind of introduce the topic by telling a story, and it's a personal story. Back in the mid-80s, I started uh, seeing HIV patients and watching uh, them suffer, and not just medically, but also in a sense of spiritually and families not embracing them. Some, several times patients would be shunned by their family and they go to try to seek some refuge in church and they could be shunned there as well. And there was a lot of loneliness and there was a lot of isolation in addition to the fear and the difficulty of dealing with a horrible disease. In 1988, I started an AIDS outpatient clinic, modeled a lot after the San Francisco General Ward 86 clinic at San Francisco General Hospital. And I picked up from them not only the medical care and the state of the art activities that they had in their clinic, but also their community outreach. Their community outreach was mostly through something called the Shanti Project, which wasn't so much religious based, but it, it did have a good spiritual base to it and trying to be a, have a holistic approach to reaching people in their homes. Later, as our clinic began to grow into the early 1990s, this suffering continued and wanted to do something about it. I tried out to reach out to the faith community, uh, but I didn't have a lot of success, mostly because I didn't have a lot of time. And I was asked by Downtown Rotary, just incidentally, to give a talk, uh, and I did. And in the audience was one of their members named uh, Ed Dixon. Ed Dixon uh, had done a lot of work on using faith-based approaches to ease the suffering of people with cancer, who, for a lot of you may know this, but back in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of stigma associated with cancer. And he took notice of what I uh, presented at the Rotary about the suffering of patients. And he called me out of the blue and said, come have lunch. And we spoke for about 45 minutes. And so only when, I don't think we ever had lunch, but we did talk for quite a while before my time ran out with him. And his main question was, if there's one thing that we needed to help bridge the gap between patients, families, the community, both in terms of care, but education of the general public, what would that be? And I said, the church, we needed to involve the church. And it really hit home with him. He is a member of the Vestavia Hills Baptist Church here in uh, uh, Vestavia Hills Methodist Church here in uh, Birmingham and had been very active in his, in his church. And they had a Reverend Joe Elmore who was leading, who was the pastor there. And we began talking and long story short, he gave me a grant to find clergy. And the goal was to find a full-time chaplain who could work out of our clinic and be able to minister to our patients, but also more importantly, perhaps, to reach out to the faith community locally and bring them into the fold of helping us provide care for HIV patients. A catalyzing moment for us was as I was planning this, there was a coincident activity in town, which was the 30th commemoration of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church from September 15th, 1963, where four girls, young girls, were killed in the bombing. And on that commemoration, we talked with Reverend Chris Hamlin, who was the pastor there, and we decided that the similarities, the parallel paths between what happened in that church in 1963 to somewhat what was happening in terms of uh, injustice 
and in terms of prejudice in our HIV community had some similarities. So we invited Mary Fisher, the famous AIDS activist who spoke at the 1992 Republican convention, bringing the chaos of that convention to total silence as she spoke. And we brought her to town and she spoke at the 16th Street Baptist Church. The title of her, of her message was called Up From Ashes. And she also spoke at the Vestavia Hills Methodist Church with Reverend Elmore. And we, we got the momentum going. And that brought the beginnings of the church community coming with us. And this was in September, 1993. Later in that year, on Christmas Eve, uh, I interviewed a young uh, Baptist minister named Malcolm Marler. And Malcolm had just moved to Birmingham uh, a little bit before our meeting. And I pitched to him on that Christmas Eve afternoon that we should perhaps work together. And he thought about it and said, yeah, this is a good fit. And so he joined us soon after. And he'll tell you his story because he's on the panel today, as is Reverend Hamlin. But he'll tell you the story about how our outreach began. And so the role of the clergy in our clinic became formalized around 1994. And it's remained that way ever since. And I think it's one of the most powerful and valued service that we provide to our patients and that we provide to our community, as you'll hear more about. To give you a little bit of overview as a pre preview of what you're gonna hear, we discovered that we had to reach clergy who are in a kind of tough position because sometimes they want to do certain things, but they have leadership that may bristle at a new initiative that might not please everyone in the church. And so we realized we had to do more than just out outreach to the clergy. We had to have outreach to the leadership, the lay leadership of the church as well. And we started a program called GRACE, G-R-A-C-E, which was giving re and receiving AIDS compassionate education. And we had these Friday morning programs that Malcolm can tell you more about as we go. But the concept that Malcolm brought to this was something we called head, heart, feet. For the first hour, we talked about the details, the head, understanding what HIV was about. Then in the second hour, we brought in a patient and they told their story. And if any of you have interviewed, especially during that time, an HIV patient who had suffered from their interactions in, in many ways with the church or with their family and the interactions in the church, those stories are biblical in power. And then after we get their head and their heart, then we give orders or um, instructions on how to use their feet, how to take that passion, how to take that knowledge and turn it into action. And you'll hear more about that. I'll, I'll save that for Reverend Marler to talk about. But that's how we started and that's how we've gone since then. I can't tell you how valuable it is to have clergy in the clinic 24 seven while we're seeing patients. And Reverend Hamlin has been with us. We recruited him uh, some years, uh, about four or five, maybe six years later, I forgot the exact dates, but he's been with us uh, for, for over 20 years now working with our patients. And the value of that is immeasurable to have a clergy on call every day in the clinic and being able to drop in, to talk with the patient, to minister with the patient is, is incredibly valuable, incredibly exciting for us knowing that we have that support. And also the outreach into the community has been quite remarkable. So that's our story, that's what happened. And I think that we can see through most any illness, for many, many people, but especially in the southeastern United States, faith is a key part of healing. And all of you who are listening in know that, know that intimately and know it well. And trying to formalize that connection between clinical care and faith and ministry is a very, very powerful force. So I think I'll close my comments there. Thank you for including me. I think the dialogue we're gonna to have today is gonna to be special. 
And I think we'll all learn a lot from each other as the day goes on. So I'll turn it back over to you, Eddie, and we'll uh, continue from there. Wow, Dr. Usak, thank you. Thank you so very much. And again, uh, we appreciate your effort and I uh, took some notes even listening to your overview. Uh, I was very inspired by that. And again, with the work that you've done and especially some things you say where we have came from and where we are today. And I thought it was very important what you said uh, you was asked to help bridge the gap between patients, family, and community, and you said you responded to uh, the church. And I thought that was very important, even when you talked about defining moments with the bombing in 1963 at the 16th Street Baptist Church, as well as with Mary, Mary Fisher visiting us in September 1993. So seeing these defining moments, and then even with the GRACE program you talked about, which aids compassion and education, and I really like that piece that you talked about, Head, Heart, and Feet, and we still provide some of those same framework today with our HIV and faith-based or work that we do. So as a person that received the compassion and comprehensive care in the Greater Birmingham area, of, I really appreciate you and you have inspired me. And again, and we thank you for your contribution. And from there, we will continue with the uh, introduction our esteemed panel. And we will start with Khadidra Abdullah. Khadidra is the founder and executive director of Rama. She's the founder of the National Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day, the District of Columbia Center for AIDS Research. Welcome, Khadidra. Hi. There, Thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> my pleasure. From there we go with our minister, uh, Jimmy Leon Gibbs. Jimmy is a minister of the United Church of Christ. He's a resident chaplain, affordable community resident association, and also of the National Sea for Welcome, Minister Gibbs. Thank you. From there, we'll go to um, Minister uh, Christopher M. Hamlin. Uh, Minister Hamlin is the pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church here in Birmingham, Alabama. He's the HIV prevention educator and testing service chaplain and HIV education specialist at the 1917 clinic at the University of Alabama, UAB. So welcome, uh, Minister Hamlin. Thanks, Eddie. From there, uh, Minister Michael Marder. He's the Senior Director of the Pastoral Care Department of Medicine in the first full-time chaplain at HIV AIDS clinic uh, in the United States with uh, Dr. Sag just uh, spoke of that. And he served in that capacity from 1994 to 2009, again, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Welcome, Minister Marder. And finally, we will go to uh, Dr. Darius Scott. He's the assistant professor at the Department of Geographically at Dartman College. Welcome, Dr. Scott. And from there, I will uh, turn it over to my co-moderator, uh, and that's uh, Elder Kerr. And Elder Kerr, it's all yours, sir. Thank you so much, and I'm, it's a real honor to be able to co-moderate this uh, panel discussion. And so we're going to ask each of the panelists to open up with a, to share highlights on how faith and spirituality have impacted HIV prevention and research and treatment efforts. And the first one up is Dr. Sag. Well, I think um, I've given a lot of introduction in my first remarks, but just to add to that a little bit from, from a more personal firsthand perspective, um, my faith tradition is Judaism. So I uh, have really since I was a young uh, child uh, was fascinated by the different types of religions that were in the world around me. And as I grew through high school, and into college, I made a point of learning as much as I could about all types of religions and all types of faith communities. And I have to say that that prepared me very well for my ultimate journey as a physician and also prepared me extremely well for the types of topics that we're gonna talk about here. And I didn't restrict my education to just Western religions. I also looked into Eastern religions and other types of faith-based approaches 
and studied atheism in a way as well, because I think to me as a provider, as, a, as someone who takes care of patients, my job is to promote healing in every way I can. And with the diversity of patient populations that we serve, it's critical for me to understand where that person lives, where, what is their spiritual home. And the more I know about their faith background, the more that I can integrate what I'm trying to do medically with how they can, how they can thrive and be successful with their health and their well-being. So that's one of the things that I focus on a lot. Um, I never, ever introduce my faith tradition into the conversation. I'm really focused on their faith tradition as it would apply to perhaps fitting in with a care plan or a way forward. And I think that's an essential part of being a complete physician. Thank you, Dr. Sag. I, those are some really key points that I think we all really need to listen to, especially not throwing our religion on someone else, and including spirituality. Our next panelist is Reverend Dr. Malcolm Mahler. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. Boy, it was a long time ago, but it has a lot of similarities to what we're going through now. Uh, with the pandemic, but staying focused on what Dr. Sag talked about when he first brought me to the 1917 clinic, HIV clinic here at UAB. The first thing I noticed was how afraid people were in the community about HIV and AIDS. There was still a lot of um, education that was being developed about how HIV was transmitted and people were afraid. And so we figured that that was the root of stigma, fear. When people are afraid of something, they want to push away to get away and they want to have a way to do that. And so many people, especially in the faith community, they were the ones who were afraid and so they turned to what they knew best, and that was their own faith traditions and tried to find ways to distance themselves. And so what we did was a lot what Dr. Sag said in gen general uh, outline that he gave. First thing I did as a chaplain, uh, I asked Dr. Sag, why did you hire me? He said, I just want to find a way for the faith communities not to hurt our patients so much. And that was the truth. And so the only thing I knew to do was to develop relationships, friendships, trust. And so I just started, started with the people I knew and I would call and set up appointments to go talk with ministers all over first in our city and later in the state. And so what we did was I would invite people to tell me their stories about their experience with HIV so that I could get an understanding of where their fear was coming from. From that, that's where we learned and came up with head, heart and feet. That I realized that many people I was talking to did not know the truth. And we needed to get people in front of them that could tell the truth. And so we started Friday Morning Grace, as Dr. Sag said. And the way I did that was at the end of my talking and developing a relationship with clergy in the community and with lay people, as I said, I'd like to invite you to Friday Morning Grace. And so people came, sometimes just a handful, other times as many as 20 people. But we did it every Friday and we learned from week to week. And so in that head, heart and feet, we brought in people like Dr. Sag and other specialists, and they told the truth and the facts. People asked questions and felt more comfortable about what they heard. 
And then someone in the audience in the group that we were talking to, I would call them up and we would start having a conversation in front of everyone. And somewhere in the conversation, someone like Alan would say, and then I got HIV. And he began to tell his story and people saw not a person living with HIV, but a person who was real and similar to them. And then thirdly, we wanted to challenge people to do something. And so we came up with something called care teams. We challenged people to do something with their feet, like John Lewis said about the African proverb he kept reminding us about in his life. When you pray, move your feet. And so that's what we did. We challenged people. You've heard the facts. You've heard from someone that desperately needs who you are and your faith, our faith calls us to respond. And so that's what we did. So we began to train people. And when we began to train people to do what they love to do on a team, we formed care teams, sometimes a half a dozen people. And those people did what they love to do when they were able to do it in a coordinated way with a built-in support system. In other words, they didn't have to do this alone. They could do the parts that they were comfortable with and leave the other parts to someone else. And we began to learn how a group works together best. And so that's what we did. Head, heart and feet. We challenged people to understand and know the truth so that they could share it. We taught people what this is like for somebody living with HIV, especially when they are afraid and needed people to be with them, not afraid of them. And then finally, when we began to train people in the first couple of years, we started on the second Saturday of every month. We would train people how to start up teams on their own. If they needed us to help find someone who had HIV who needed them, then we helped them do that. And so they began. And within the first couple of years, we had 125 teams in the greater Birmingham area from congregations. They were people who had been touched personally and not only been touched personally, maybe because someone in their family had HIV or they knew someone, but because they wanted to do something, but didn't know what to do. I think it's still applicable. Stigma, fear is addressed by head, heart and feet. The truth that moves our heart, that calls us to care for others. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mahler. You said some really key things, and I think the one of the most important is building up trust. Also, um, when you pray, move your feet. It just says a whole lot. And so we're going to continue our conversation with the uh, our next panelist sharing highlights on how faith and spirituality have impacted HIV prevention, research, and treatment. And we have up next Reverend Dr. Christopher Hamlin. Thanks, George, and it's an honor to uh, be here. I'm grateful to Dr. Sag, who um, in 2002 extended an invitation for me to become a part of this amazing team here at UAB's 1917 Clinic as the second uh, full-time chaplain. Probably uh, Malcolm and I served as the chaplains at a HIV clinic, and that probably was the first anywhere in the in the nation, maybe even the world, uh, where you had two designated full-time chaplains. Mine was uh, specific though. Uh, in the early 2000s, Dr. Sad noticed these uh, infection rates spiking, especially in the African-American community. So I was invited to the clinic in 2002 
to pay focus attention on what was happening in the black community. As a pastor who had served 16th Street for 10 years, came to UAB initially in 2000, worked in the provost's office, and the timing was just right to move to um, the 1917 clinic, become more involved in, in, in the community. And um, had had a dear friend in the late 1980s uh, who died from HIV. And, um, and then ar around 2000, um, 2001, had another dear friend. And as a pastor at 16th Street, I was encouraged by a member of my church, who's also happened to be a Morehouse brother, um, uh, to get more involved as we started seeing numbers spike in the black community. And no one, for the most part in the black community in Birmingham was really doing anything, especially in terms of faith organizations. Uh, so my member encouraged me, Ted Deborah encouraged me uh, that I needed to get involved. And I joined the board of AIDS Alabama and uh, from there just started seeing what was happening. So it was just a natural affinity that when Dr. Sass said, can you come to the clinic and get involved in this at this level, it was ideal time. Um, so my goal was to talk with pastors about HIV and get pastors to become more involved uh, uh, with HIV, especially on the prevention side. And as Malcolm shared earlier about compassionate care and, uh, and how do we translate from head to heart to feet. Um, so when you look at the African-American community, uh, according to Pew Research, even today, this uh, statistic primarily remains true. You're talking about 88% of African-Americans are involved in at some level in, in faith organizations, whether it's the church, uh, whether it's a mosque, uh, whether it's a, a parachurch group, uh, about 88% of African-Americans are involved in some, some aspect of a faith organization. So one, you have a ready audience, um, an audience that's already in place, ready for credible information. And I think that's the key. And Malcolm kind of hinted at that. The information needs to be credible. The source from which it is coming from also needs to be, uh, needs to be credible. And, uh, and if the message is credible, the information is credible, people will listen. Uh, I remember when I came here, we started testing as a team at the 1917 Clinic in 2003, just two of us, myself, and my my colleague Kelly Ross Davis, and um, and and the first time I went out to our African American church, I called a friend and said, "Hey, I need your help," and um, didn't really know what I was going to do, and and grateful for Dr. Sad because we got together and he modeled for me what it is that he wanted to accomplish. He went to that first uh, uh, church, that first evening presentation, uh, and gave the talk, and I had, had kind of said to my friend who was passing that congregation now, and his response was, "I I want you to come." but it has to be abstinent based. And that's what we were getting a lot of um, in, in, in the early 2000s. I, it, you know, it's okay to talk about human sexuality, it's okay to talk about HIV, but it has to be abstinence based. And I said to him, well, we're gonna end it with a QA. and a And if your members ask about uh, the, 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 the efficiency or effectiveness of using condoms, that opens the door. And he said, if they ask, you no, know, you need to answer. And we opened it up. And the first question out of the door was, how effective are condoms uh, as a barrier against HIV? And, and that just opened the door for some more realistic conversations. In 2003, that was one congregation uh, who allowed me to come in and, and, and do that. 2004, it moved to about five congregations. 2006, it moved, moved to about 15 congregations. Uh, and then later, it just continued to grow in mushroom. We started doing um, uh, presentations uh, HIV testing at events, Magic Johnson came to Birmingham um, at, and uh, we filled up a church with young people. And uh, that was our first time in 2003 offering testing. And we had to quickly get that together to test a whole bunch of young people, but we, we did it. And, and, and we realized that if the information is credible and the source of that information is credible, people will respond to the information. So here in Birmingham, uh, we have tried to model um, uh, what it is to take advantage of a ready audience. And the African-American faith-based community is, is a ready audience. It's also not only a ready audience, it has a history of social involvement. Uh, from, from the days of enslavement to, to now, uh, the, the African-American faith-based community has always been a place of, of social involvement. With, when something's not right in the community, uh, that typically is the place that, that, that gets the, the ball rolling. Um, and, and we recognize that, 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 and I think, again, Dr. Sass' vision for um, uh, talking about 
and 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 Doctor Said kind of gave a disclaimer about his own faith as um, in terms of being a Jew. Um, uh, I, I dismiss that. that he doesn't talk about his faith when he does presentation, but it's so obvious that he's a man of passionate faith and that just comes through. And I think that's obvious because he hired Malcolm and he brought me here and he, and he saw that connection. And, uh, and, and, and again, you, you, you have this in the black community, this awareness that if you want something done, if you want to see the community transform, uh, you cannot dismiss, you cannot ignore, you cannot bypass uh, the black faith community, the black church. You cannot get, Bypass the black mosque. You can't. It cannot be. Cannot be done. And in addition to being a place of social activism and transformation in our community, it is also a place where resources to assist uh, in community transformation are, are are also readily available. And sometimes you have to challenge those resources to be placed where they need to go. But again, once people understand the need, then they're they're willing to use what resources they have to make a, a, a social transformation. Um, the other thing that the, the faith-based community offer is uh, an avenue for education and avenue for programs. So many of the, the presentations that we made were to health fa at health fairs. Uh, the Nurses Guild would sponsor a health fair. Somebody else would sponsor a health fair and they would invite us to come talk about um, HIV and we would do a 15, 20 minute presentation and then go to a private area and offer um, HIV uh, testing. And initially, um, we know that condoms, when used properly, is an effective barrier against the transmission of HIV and some other uh, STIs. We, we know that. However, getting the African American faith based community to buy into that has been difficult. Uh, but as we continue to talk and as pastors realize and were honest about what was going on in their congregations, they now have become more and more willingness a willingness to accept even to talk about uh, the use of condoms as an effective barrier uh, against um, uh, the potential uh, infection of, of HIV and other STIs. For me, I see it as a means of salvation. If, if this is one way of saving a person uh, and, and maybe the only way of saving a person from, from HIV or for something else, uh, if it means giving them a condom, give them the condom. And, and, and I'm not gonna put uh, the moral uh, judgment on someone's head because they may be having sex outside of marriage or doing whatever. I, I, and, and we get a lot of that. And I understand that. And you have to walk through and massage that very carefully. Uh, but the key is how can we prevent infection rates from going higher and higher, especially in the African-American African community? Uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about is, in terms of the faith-based community, is the ability to touch practical situations and congregations, organizations. Malcolm talked about um, and Dr. Seth about our clinic offering compassionate care. Uh, one of the things that has been such an inspiration to me is to, to work with a team who really do care. And, uh, and I think the vast majority, about 3,400 plus patients, will tell you that this is a place that genuinely dis, 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 displays care in a very real and sensitive way. Uh, most congregations have sick and shut in programs, like I said, Nurses Guild. You train them how to be compassionate and care uh, that that in our congregations, we we know someone who is gay. We know someone who is is maybe doing a lot of things that put them at risk for HIV. Uh, we, we know it, we may we may not talk about all those issues around or those 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 topics, but we know what is going on in our congregations. So it requires that we have some honest, heartfelt discussions about what is happening. And uh, and if one of our members who just so happens to be gay or straight or trying to figure it out is infected with HIV. Uh, it's not our place to be in the place of judgment. I think the, the, the faith-based organization, the church, the mosque or whatever, our place is to how can we offer compassionate care and demonstrate the love of God to that individual. And I think as pastors and as ministers begin to see that, they understand this is what our mission really is. It's not to be standing in a place of judgment. I leave all that to God. God will figure all that out. My job is, is, is the person that's standing in front of me. How can I demonstrate the love of God in a very practical and real, real way? So if a person is sick, we need to minister to them. And Malcolm talked about the care team approach, uh, the head, the heart approach, uh, and, 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 and then putting feet to action to make sure that those persons know that we genuinely care. Uh, we care about them. And, and then the, 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 the goal for the African-American church, we've always had a, um, um, 
uh, ad hoc way of offering care teams uh, to our members. Uh, and, and this became a very systematic way of saying if, if a person in our congregation is, is living with HIV and need some help and assistance, uh, we ought to be in place as a congregation to offer help and assistance to those persons uh, who need that. The, the good news, and, and, and I'm sure Dr. Sack can talk about this more than I can, the good news uh, after all these years of HIV care uh, treatment and research, um, a lot of people are living uh, long lives and the quality of life is so much better than what it was in the 80s. And when I came to the clinic, uh, in, in 2002, we have an email system called Angel Wings. When one of our patients died, we would send out an Angel Wing email to all of our team. Uh, and when I first came to the clinic, they were going out every day, sometimes multiple times during the day and during the week. Uh, we rarely get Angel Wings. They, they are so far in between than what it was in 2002 when I came to the clinic. That shows how much progress uh, has been made. And, and, and when we get to one thing that we can do, I'm going to talk about uh, how the, how the African-American faith-based community and how the church, uh, partnering with the mosque and others, can really still be a place of great energy for transformation. So I appreciate being a part of this panel uh, and spending this time uh, with everyone. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Dr. Hamlin. It's, uh, you spoke about truth quite a bit. and. Uh, one of the things you talked about was talking about condoms and safer sex and that. But I think that we need to become more comfortable talking about sex and sexuality, and especially from the pulpit. And so I'm going to bring our next person up, uh, Ms. Khadija Abdul. Hey, George. How are you? Hey, sister. <laughs> I love with you. <laughs> So, um, you know, religion is the backbone of many people, including um, faith. And people, you know, find support and guidance through faith, through difficult times, through tumultuous times, through times where of sorrow are times of happiness. And um, we look for support through our faith texts, through what our leaders are saying, and even being part of the faith community, you see people of your same faith, they're sharing the same kind of passions, the same kind of thoughts and ideas. You feel connected. You feel like you have a place that you can call home, right? Um, sometimes it comes to HIV, that feeling of community can fall apart. Um, you might not feel welcome in your community anymore because people might have outdated information about HIV or AIDS, or might say things that are stigmatizing or you might not hear about it from your faith leader. Um, and you might not think that's something that they care about. Now, you know, for me, when I started the work with Rahma, here's my shirt, our being part of the HIV world, I was, um, you know, in college and I met a Muslim man living with AIDS. I was studying to be a nurse. And he told me he didn't feel welcome in the mosque or the masjid because people didn't understand about HIV. They thought it was some kind of, disease that you can catch by just sitting next to somebody, quote unquote catch, or that is something that happens to people who are sinful, or you know you deserve to have it. And he felt ostracized, he didn't feel welcome. And it literally broke my heart. And it made me realize that when I was growing up, we very rarely talked about sexual health. So HIV and AIDS was just something completely further down the line. And it kind of, pushed me or motivated me to talk about this. And then my friend became positive um, at 19 years old. So me thinking about faith and thinking about, you know, and Islam is a very sex positive religion. Like we talk about sex, talk about intimacy, all well, came here through sex. So why are we talking about it more to our children, our, our youth or having more um, educational classes or awareness classes? about HIV and AIDS, our sexual health, our administration, or hygiene, these are all part of sexual health. Um, so I think with faith, you know, I think that it's important that faith leaders and faith communities step up in regards to prevention efforts because you're gonna lose people and you have lost people and they probably won't come back. Or they might start their own faith communities and leave yours at their own safe spaces. Um, so one of the similar work that Rahma does is that we have went around to 
mosques. We began, when we first started out, we went around to mosques and we did educational workshops. And the first time I did a workshop, nobody showed up. <laughs> and then we were like, dang, what's, what are we doing wrong? And we realized because the topic is HIV. Who wants to come to the HIV educational workshop? So we had to become creative and we joined like health fairs and had a table, for example, under the brows of a big health fair. They had blood pressure screenings, you know, so on and so forth. So we had a table HIV. And we found that people would come to the table curious about asking information about it. People ask for condoms too in safe environments. And I know, I know someone mentioned before about they already tell you about abstinence when they come to you know faith spaces. People are having sex regardless of their religion before marriage and after marriage. So you have to be cognizant of that fact and just wake up and be real about it. So we need to find ways to provide people with information, arm them information so they can utilize the information to be educated and make informed decisions. So, you know, we've done workshops and massages. We've done youth education trainings of Muslim youth because we realize that if we aren't learning it at home, our youth are learning outside somewhere in their environment. So why can't we just take over and start doing this and bring in our faith teachings? But so my original idea Rahma, which means mercy in Arabic, was to focus specifically on the Muslim community. However, um, as we grew over time, we realized, and we were, I mean, we kind of knew this from the beginning, but HIV stigma is in all faith communities, <laughs> not just Muslim, not just Christian. We hear about Christian communities more so than most other faith communities usually, but it's in all faith communities. So we kind of expanded our work and it kind of pushed us to find to found National Faith HIV and AIDS Awareness Day. And that day, which George is part of, one of the founders, <laughs> that day is to really bring together all faith communities, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, Sikh, Hindu, Baha'i, um, all and people of other spiritualities and backgrounds to come together and work towards addressing HIV stigma in faith communities. Because people are going to leave faith communities. They're not going to feel safe. They're not going to come back. And one day they're going to have an empty mosque our empty church, our empty synagogue, empty temple, because people aren't feeling safe. And, you know, there's one story that really, 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 really troubled me. Um, so as Muslims, we fast in Ramadan for about 30 days, from sunrise to sunset, and then we break fast, and we eat, we pray, you know, we're thankful. And there was this one Muslim person that went to the mosque, and, um, you know, they wanted to help, they wanted to volunteer and help serve food to the Muslims who were breaking their fast and ready to eat. And somebody knew this person had HIV and this person that knew kind of disclosed this person's status. And the people in the mosque found out and they didn't want to take food from this person. They were afraid they would catch HIV from touching the same spoon or the same plate this person served them food on. And that person said, I ain't going back there no more. And I won't go back either. If I was me, I wouldn't go back there either because People are judging, they're being stigmatized, um, you know, perpetrating stigma, and they're not creating a safe space for people of all backgrounds, of all conditions, of all lived experiences. So we find it as our duty to really talk with big communities and bring in people who have the knowledge. I mean, some people say, well, I don't know anything about HIV. Okay, that's not an excuse. Bring in somebody that does know about HIV and they can have a discussion. You know, have some resources that can bring, um, that you can give to people. So, you know, as I mentioned, Rahma is the Arabic word of mercy. And in Islam, this is one of our main teachings is to have compassion and to have mercy. When we read the Quran, we start off with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. So mercy is in every single surah. And when we pray, we start off the same type of verse in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, the most compassionate. So we, at Rahma, we use these teachings as our guide and the work that we do. We try to have mercy and compassion in our work because even myself, I've continuously learned about HIV and AIDS and I have been um, sympathizing towards people as well. I might have used words that are sympathizing. I might have said things that have hurt people and I didn't do it intentionally. Um, and I'm always open to learning and hearing different people and telling me like, hey, it's not a cool way to say this, or hey, you know, we need you to do something differently because you're also perpetuating stigma. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know that. So people have good hearts, they have good intentions, um, but it's also important to be educated and accurate on what you are doing. And so for me, I'm ever learning, ever, ever evolving on this. So when it comes to faith leaders, I have found that 
a lot of people still aren't really having an environment that kind of focuses on um, HIV and AIDS. And I believe in every faith, we have the concept of compassion and mercy, universal mercy. So everyone should feel safe in their faith community, regardless of their faith background, of their HIV status, you know, who they love, whatever is happening in their lives, everyone should feel safe in their faith community. So that's the role of Rahma and the role of Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day. And we started HIV AIDS Awareness Day, um, Faith HIV AIDS Awareness Day back in 2017. And uh, Hamdila, all praise to God, this year it can officially recognize mm -hmm. as a federally recognized holiday or awareness day. Um, HIV.gov calendar and like it's a big accomplishment for all of us. George, me, and the others that are part of this, or you know, Dr. Burley, um, Cedric, Carrie, um, Reverend Mike Shume, Reverend William Francis, uh, so many different people that are really involved in the hard work of this. It became an official awareness day. And now we're hoping that, and then we're seeing like people using the hashtags and we're seeing people of different faith backgrounds coming together, doing events on this day, raising mm -hmm. awareness. And that is beautiful and that is powerful. And that is one step in the right direction of addressing um, HIV stigma. And yes, we should have done this years ago, but mm -hmm. we're here now. And I think all we can do now is move forward. So yes, faith, faith communities have a role to play. Faith leaders have a role to play. I believe we can do it. And if you don't know information, ask <laughs> and get those resources out and be there for your community and support your community. Thank you. Thank you, Khadija. This is why I love you so much. I love you too. <laughs> you really pointed out faith communities have to become creative and innovative. And that is just one of the key things. You know, this changing where we're all online now and we're not able to meet in person and the digital divide that's happening. Um, Dr. Scott, who was supposed to go up next, is having internet problems. So we're unfortunately will not be hearing from him. So I'm going to bring to the stage uh, Minister Jimmy Gibbs, another good friend. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm used to being behind the scenes. So this is um, um, not that I'm not used to public speaking, but this is um, something very personal to me. So my first experience with HIV and AIDS came in the form of me caregiving for my best friend who contracted uh, AIDS in the 80s. And I became his caregiver because his mother worked night shift and I was caregiving for him during the day. And this was my first experience and I took care of him. And from there, I promised him that I would do every and anything I could to make sure that his life um, had meaning and that I would do everything that I could to work in the field of HIV and to make sure that things would be different um, and impactful. And this is what I did. Um, from there, I went to work for an organization that was providing housing and supportive services for people living with HIV. And that organization was called ACRA. Uh, and it's the Affordable Community Residence Association. Uh, we've been in existence for 30 years. I went to them about 25 years ago. At that time, we opened a 24 hour um, assisted care facility. People went there because they could not go home. Um, the uh, situation there was quite grave. Uh, we provided compassionate care and most, um, most of them could not go back home to their families. And most of the staff there, uh, we had 24 hour staff and we staffed the rest of it with volunteers. And we had a very compassionate care team we are all talking about um, providing that compassionate love and compassionate care. I came from a long line of um, pastors. My grandfather and great grandfather were both pastors and worked in this area in North Carolina. So it was uh, not out of the ordinary when my calling came upon my heart that I would become a pastor as well in the United Church of Christ. 
So I knew that providing pastoral care in that setting would come natural to me. Regardless of faith, regardless of religion, compassionate care was what we gave um, at Blevins home. Blevins was a place to come where you were welcome. It follows the UCC mantra where all are welcome and all were welcome. All were accepted. It was free. You didn't have to pay. Regardless of income, you were welcome. And that's what we provided. And that's what we did from the bottom of our hearts. And people gave to keep us sustainable, to keep us going. And we tried our best to make sure that people had a viable life existence until it was time for them to go home. I've done that in everything that I've done in my life. We've tried to do that. I tried to make sure people had the rich experience and tried to make sure that everything I touched was impactful in one way or another. And just sharing those experiences with others, I've learned so much by bringing that wealth of experience with the National Cab Coalition and learning from others how they impacted their communities, working with the CIFAR and looking at what community engagement looks like in different communities and seeing how rich and diverse community engagement looks like from all across the nation. We all approach community engagement differently. We all see HIV from a different perspective. I've seen it from the West Coast to the East Coast. I've worked with many of you in your communities and seen how we approach each other with compassion and care. I've worked with researchers on various research projects all over the nation. Most in cure, most in some competitive research project that they think would allow us to find a cure to end HIV. This has been my goal since Elijah contracted AIDS years ago, to find a cure. 30 something years later, it is still my goal to find a cure, just that simple. Mine isn't the overwhelming goal of all of the bells and whistles. It's just simply to find a cure, to help my friends, to help Elijah, to see the end goal. It's the end goal to find a cure, to make life so rich, so impactful. That's the end goal for me because Elijah's time here was so horrible. He lived his last days in pain. And now I get to see my friends that are living with HIV thrive and survive. They look happy, they're gained, they have gained weight, they look great. This is what I prayed for. This is what I pray for every night. To see this is what the other ministers here on the panel see as well. We've seen the dark end and now we see the end of the light. The light looks good, the light looks bright. The light looks promising. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. I'm sorry that mine is so personal. I'm sorry that I take 
so much pain and joy in seeing that this revelation has come to pass. But I really mean it from the bottom of my heart that I've enjoyed working with so many people from across the country. I've shared their stories. I've heard their pain. I've heard their celebrations. But I get a chance to see the victory in research, the victory in working with all of you. And I get a chance to see what community engagement really looks like. And community engagement looks like all of us teaming up together, working on solutions to bring this to a gracious end. All of us can work together to do that. And this is great. And this is my goal. At 58 years old, I never thought that I would see a day like this. And this makes me happy. It's promising. It's delightful. Thank you. Jimmy, all I can say is, wow, you, you've said a lot there. But one thing that I don't want you to say is that you're sorry. Your passion and the work you do is just so amazing that you are truly an angel. And I have to say, with someone living over 25 years with HIV myself, it's because of everyone like this on this panel is allowing us to live this long and to be so productive. You know, when we first had HIV, we didn't even think we we're going to retire. Now we're talking about retirement. And, you right. know, there wasn't a lot of education done, but now there's a lot of education going on. So... Mm -hmm. At this time, I'm going to bring up the rest of the panelists so we could have a uh, few more questions to answer. But um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to all the panel for your very insightfulness on why we're celebrating during this live stream. So can we bring up the first question? What role do medical providers and caregivers play in helping people living with HIV cope through religion, spirituality, and faith? Now, Jimmy, I'm gonna toss it to you first. Yes. What I have seen in my role at, um, at Wake Med, where I am an on-call chaplain, um, We've gotten most, most of my support has been through uh, our providers in providing us with the support that we need to um, provide that spiritual care. It were not for our CEOs and it weren't for the support of our folks in the, as our providers of care, we would not be able to do the ministry that we do. And I have to say that as an on-call chaplain for 15 years at one of the biggest um, uh, at one of the biggest hospitals here in our in our state, I would not be able to do the work that I do in providing that care if it were not through our medical providers. Our medical providers and and um, make sure that we have the resources that we need to provide that critical care. When we went into COVID and and our when we went into COVID, they made sure that we as chaplains were comfortable in making sure that we had the resources that we felt comfortable enough to go into COVID rooms. We had made sure that we, and it's before COVID, we made sure that I was the HIV educator when we decided that we were going to do HIV work uh, as a hospital and making sure that I educated all of the uh, team on what HIV looked like in the past and what HIV looks like today. They trusted me to make sure that they were educated on HIV. And I make, I was, I was happy about that because they knew that I had the vast experience in what HIV looked like in the past and future. So I'm trust and the medical providers were trusting of me. And I just like to know that um, I appreciated them putting that trust in me. And when we went forward with COVID, they were just making sure that we were comfortable enough to know that, trusting them to know that we were okay with COVID, we were okay with that, 
and it was comfortable. So I wanted to make sure we were comfortable. Thank you. Kadesha? Uh, so, you know, I got my start as a caregiver. Um, when, you know, like I mentioned before, I was again in the hospital. When the multi-mallers of AIDS, you know, came and was admitted to the room, he was not a very pleasant um, uh, He was very mean to the nurses. Um, you know, didn't listen to what they had to say, gave him a hard time. And I was like, ooh, I don't want to be assigned to him. I don't want to have to care for him because he seems very difficult. <laughs> so, of course, one day I come to work and I'm assigned to him. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I go to his room and I'm like, okay, listen, <laughs> I'm here to support you. So please don't be mean to me. <laughs> and, you know, he gave me this look like, trying to measure me, like, give me an up and down kind of look. And then, you know, he just, he was fine. We built a relationship, we built a connection. I learned I, learned I went to, I knew some of his family from different parts because the city is so small where I grew up at. And, he opened up and he said to me last year earlier, like how he doesn't feel welcome in the community. So like, you know, how he didn't feel welcome, how, you know, he, he you know, faced stigma, um, how it was in a safe space for him. And it made me realize that faith brings people together. Faith has that connection. So if you're caring for people of different faiths, whether it's in a hospital or a long-term care facility, or you know, a medical provider's office or doctor's office, make sure you have people there that represent the different faiths you care for. Because it builds that connection. It makes somebody feel it makes someone feel safe. They feel more welcome. They feel okay, someone here, someone here gets me, they understand me, they understand where I'm coming from, in regards to my faith perspective. So you really try to incorporate that into your spaces. Because, you know, even if we're facing something that might be terminal or something that might have long-term, lifelong effects, sometimes when we have faith, it's that one thing that can get us through. It's that one connection that can bring some type of peace over us, our contentment, and make us be satisfied with God's will or, or have hope that, you know, things will become different for us. Faith can be hope. It can be light. It can be love. It could be so many different things. It, it comes in the forms of many different types of things. Faith can be seen in the form of person, in the form of medical care, in the form of just reading something, in the form of someone's smile. So, you know, I would like to think that I had an impact on this man, but he had a huge impact on me. <laughs> he really shaped the way that I perceive things, um, how I thought about things, how I thought about my faith, and in regards to teaching and education. So I think we have to keep these type of things in mind when we navigate our work. How can our faith, spirituality, how can it bring comfort and ease? How can we learn as providers? How can we learn from our people that we care for? And how can they learn from us? And hopefully by learning from each other, we can help address stigma and work towards creating a safe space for everyone of all faith backgrounds, of all beliefs, of all lived experiences, and really work towards creating this space um, and then, you know, hopefully it can help with coping and all the different other aspects. But this is what I'm thinking when I think about caregivers and providers' roles in helping people living HIV and coping through religion, spirituality, and faith. Thank you, Khadija. Uh, we're going to move on to our second question. And I'm going to ask Dr. Sag to open this question. And it is, what is the role of faith-based organizations in HIV prevention and care in America? Well, I think there's a large role that faith-based organizations can play, and I think they are playing it already. Um, we see um, that engagement really at the local level mostly. Um, yes, there's some policies and there's some education that occurs in large faith great based organizations coming together. I mean, now by Zoom, I guess, but historically face to face. Um, but I think what really works is what you've heard throughout this symposia so far. And that is, it's really about the one-on-one, -on -one. it's the personal connections, it's the engagement um, every day. And I, I do feel compelled to point out one thing, and that is 
that a faith-based approach works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for everyone. And what we have to do is discover in our interactions with patients what their faith-based uh, tradition is, uh, how much it plays a role in their life at the present time. And if it's a large part of who they are and what, what they're about, then engagement makes a huge difference. And so I think that's really what we're talking about today. And I think it's also what's going to carry us forward into the future. Others may, I'm sure, have other perspectives or want to uh, pick up on that. Dr. Sag, you just made a very good point about someone's faith and spirituality. So I just want to open up the next question for all of our panelists. How has religion helped in or hindered the community response to HIV? Because I think that's really getting to what we're trying to talk about. Well, let me, let me kick that one off. So, pick up where I came from at the beginning. Um, I hate to say it, but there was a lot of hindrance yeah. historically. I mean, a lot. Um, I, I, can, I can't, it, it breaks my heart to even recall some of the stories, um, uh, including a very infamous uh, billboard of a church in Birmingham uh, that, that put up on it, uh, this is, AIDS is, is God's retribution for sin, right? I mean, I mean mm -hmm. how, can, mm -hmm. how can, I mean, it's like right there for the public to, to just see, and you kind of go, um, what is driving this? And and not just the hatefulness, but the hurt that a person with HIV driving by would see that. And, and you could, I mean, it's bad enough just to see it on any billboard, but a billboard outside of a faith institution is, in my view, criminal. Maybe not legally criminal, but it's morally criminal. And that's just an example of what we heard. We had. We had people protesting funerals back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I mean, carrying signs outside. The family is burying their dead. And there are people with picket signs saying that this is God's retribution. The God that, that I, I know doesn't act that way. And I think there had been a lot of harm done. And it was more than insult to injury. It was a dagger to the heart of a lot of the folks who we took care of uh, in terms of their esteem, their morale, their ability to cope was badly damaged by that type of an environment. I'm glad to say, um, as we heard earlier, that things are better, I mean, quite a bit better. And I think the, the medical breakthroughs have helped us a lot. Um, there's still stigma and there's still hate, but it's, it's been uh, markedly attenuated uh, over the last two decades. Thank you. Dr. Mahler? Yeah, I would just add to what Dr. Sag said, and that is that more than anything, as people of faith, we are called to care for the sick. We are called to care for people who are sick. And so we don't get to choose which sickness <laughs> we support as opposed to we are called um, in our faith, in the Christian faith tradition, Jesus said, just as you care for people who are sick, you are caring for me. Mm -hmm. And so it's a reminder of the, I think the gift that, that, HIV AIDS community can give to the faith community is to remind us about the basics of what we say we believe. It's the living out of that. And that's always harder than saying it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hamlin. I'll just add. I'll just add one, one, there's a powerful passage of scripture, and I think it can cross all faith groups. Those who walk in darkness have seen a marvelous light. And, and, and whenever we see that light, it, we are to be carriers of that light and dispel darkness. And 
I, I know in my 20 years of, of being um, here at UAB, I have seen so much light um, being given to so many people who were in darkness, especially in the faith community. Uh, those congregations who, who you never thought would uh, host a HIV event. Um, and now where we used to try to call them, they call us. Uh, rarely do I have to call anybody now. Uh, people are, are reaching out to us for support of what they're trying to do. That is a, an amazing transformation uh, in the 18 years that I've been at the clinic and, and over uh, you know, 25 years of being involved in HIV in the Birmingham community. And that's a good thing. Thank you so much. And what we try to do uh, with each of these live streams is to have a call for action. So we ask each of our panelists to come up with one or two sentences on what your call to action for us to do, who's observing this uh, live stream that we can actually do. So I'm gonna open it up with uh, Minister Jimmy Gibbs. I think our call to action is to continue to reach out and continue work that we're called to do. And that is to uh, continue advocacy, continue social justice when it comes to people living um, with HIV, continue to make sure that they have a place to live, make sure that we continue to do that work that we're called to do because um, I think housing and supportive services are key to making sure that people live and thrive and have a healthy life. Um, and I think that's one of the organizations that I work with and we wanna make sure that housing is key. Once people are housed um, and have supportive services, that's key to uh, making sure that they are going to thrive and live a productive and happy life. Thank you, Khadija. Um, I would say, keep doing the work, you know, don't stop now, keep doing the work, especially now in the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. People living with HIV may be feeling isolated, you know, have access to barriers to care. A lot of our attention now is on COVID, but people are still here living with HIV, mm -hmm. still need support, still need love. Some people are dealing with mental health, um, you know, conditions. So it's very important that we keep doing the work, checking in on people if we can, um, raising awareness, keep making noise about it because you know HIV is here and we see the stigma that's starting to come around COVID. We see that happening with HIV, right? Um, so we need to make sure that we're still here to support those who need it, um, still here to address the stigma and really keep doing the work and do it with compassion, do it with rahma, do it with mercy. Um, you know, in my faith, you know, when uh, we are always taught to want for our brother, our sister, we want for ourselves. So you want to be healthy, you want to have a good life. If you want to live a stigma-free life, have that same want for everyone around you and do it with compassion. When someone is not feeling good or they're sick, we are called in our faith to visit the sick. We get a lot of reward in that. So do that, you know, be there for those who might be, you know, suffering from COVID. Be there for those who might be living with HIV. Be there for those who might have the flu. Be there for those who might have a mental health condition. Be there for them because it could affect you too. You're not immune and you want someone to be there for you as well. So that's my last word. Just keep doing the work. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Dr. Mahler. Yes, for me, I think it um, this time, especially during the pandemic, uh, we are frustrated like everyone else and not being able to do our faith practice in the same way that we always have, which quite frankly might be a good thing. Yeah. Because part of part of what this does is it helps us to remember we're called to go out into the community, not stay sequestered in our faith buildings. And so my hope is that we need to learn lessons from the pandemic to help us with people living with HIV or cancer or Alzheimer's or whatever it might be that we are called to go to them and not wait on them to come to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Dr. Hamlin? Uh, not to be dismissive of the significance and historic importance of, of the black church and congregation. Uh, they still are probably in our communities, uh, the most important institution and, and they are the, the place where transformation genuinely ought to happen and can happen. And um, so uh, for those of us who are in uh, faith groups like chaplains and leadership, uh, this is an easy conversation for us. Uh, but for those who may not be connected to HIV the way that we are connected, uh, this still is a difficult conversation for them and they need our uh, support, our love, our care and our compassion. So I, I would just admonish us um, not to be dismissive of those opportunities that still are available to us. And Dr. Sag. For those of us who are in the trenches, seeing patients one-on-one -on -one, day to day, I think we should keep our ears open, listen. Um, listen carefully as we talk with folks. And if they're suffering, explore, probe a little bit about whether faith is a major part of their tradition and whether they're engaged in that. And if it is, then use that opening as a way to get them on a path, help find a path of healing. And we're fortunate that we have our chaplain in the clinic. But for those of you who aren't so fortunate with that, um, understanding in your church community, understanding and wherever it is you're interacting with people, just to keep your ear open to the, for the suffering and then a path that, that a faith-based tradition can actually serve as a real conduit towards healing. And I think that works for a lot of people. And after all, at the end of the day, that's our job, is to get people to a state of health and well-being where they can thrive and contribute and be happy. And that's the goal of all of us. It's not so easy to achieve, even for us personally sometimes, but that's the, that's what our ultimate goal is here. And by working through all the tools available to us and all the pathways, I think we can help more people. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. I would just ask that as a community, and what we try to do here is to look for other interfaith that we can work with and develop programs that not just in our religion, but outside of our religion, because they can be so enriching. And mm -hmm. so thanks again for your very powerful words and inspiration as we celebrate the role of faith and spirituality. And at this time, I would like to call upon our fearless leader, Dr. Robin Lancy. Thank you so much. It's been such a joy to listen to everyone and to just uh, be so inspired by um, the, the, the heart um, that I hear throughout everyone's um, sentiments and just the passion and compassion that you have um, for the work and just how blessed we are to have all of you in the work that you're doing and um, just so inspired by everyone. Um, uh, just thinking about Dr. Mike Sags, um, comments about the head, heart, feet model. We, um, you know, this many years, um, you know, after he you know, really brought that to light, we used the same model um, in 2016 when we were working with um, pastors here in Alabama to, because in 2016, the um, AME Church, African Methodist Episcopal Church passed legislation where, um, all clergy at all levels were required to have a three hour training on HIV education. And thankfully we had just started this new inner CFAR, CFAR faith and spirituality research collaborative, Eddie Jackson and I, and um, had relationship with pastor Ronald Sterling who asked us if we could help them do that. And we were able to do that across Alabama. And we had for the feet, what we did was we had actually um, work with the aid service organizations and community-based organizations to be there, to be able to provide condoms, to do HIV testing after the um, heart uh, message from Pastor Sterling and having, um, uh, and as they requested a lady um, with H living with HIV share her story and just the impact 
of them sharing their stories. It was um, just, as you can imagine, quite amazing. And Eddie sharing in the beginning, sort of the HIV 101. But the research that we've been able to do with this community engaged work um, has been really impactful and we're very thankful for that. Um, and so with that, it's been great to um, just kind of recollect and um, be able to think about uh, how far we've come and just what a great group um, that we have together through this inter CFAR Faith and Spirituality Research Collaborative. And so on behalf of the inner CFAR Faith and Spirituality Research Collaborative, I want to thank the DC CFAR for providing this wonderful platform and to Kalani Upshaw, who is our uh, wonderful um, production specialist now in doing this today, um, as well as our um, uh, moderators and um, our esteemed panel members. And we are so very thankful for that. We are looking forward to our part two of our mental health seminar um, uh, of webinars. And so the next one will be on stigma and which we heard a lot about today and, um, and how we can address and the need for doing addressing stigma. And um, that presentation will be largely um, research-based and we're looking forward to that um, in January. And um, we hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. And Kalani will share um, about how you can uh, view all of these in the future. Hello, everyone. My name is Kalani Upshaw. I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA at the UAB School of Public Health Department of Health Behavior. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists and moderators for participating in today's webinar on celebrating the role of faith and spirituality in HIV prevention, research, and treatment, provided by the inter -CFAR Faith and Spirituality Research Collaborative Fall Webinar Series. If you've missed um, part of today's discussion and you would like to check out the complete webinar or previous webinars, you can access them at the UAB CFAR Behavioral and Community Sciences Core YouTube channel. For more information on upcoming webinars, events, and HIV research, please follow us at UAB CFAR uh, BCSC on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you all for attending, and have a great day. Thank you.